All right, let's open our Bibles to Psalm 12 this morning. Book of Psalms, Psalm chapter number 12. Or I guess Psalm 12, not Psalm chapter 12, technically. Now, for the foundation of the sermon this morning, I want to begin by here uh, reading here in Psalm 12. We're going to read verse 1 down through verse 8, the entire psalm focusing on verse 6 and 7. Very familiar verses for most of us about how God has promised that He would preserve His Word, all of His words. Psalm 12, verse 1, To the chief musician upon Shemineth, the psalm of David, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, With our tongue will we prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. So according to verse 6 and 7, not only are the words of the Lord pure words, but the Bible states very plainly that the Lord Himself is going to preserve those pure words. Now let me ask you something. If God... If God is who God says He is, and God has promised that He is going to preserve His pure words, all of them, is there anything that any mortal man could possibly do to stop that from happening? And the answer, if you believe the Bible, is no. There is nothing that any mortal man could do to stop God from doing what He said He would do, which is preserving His words, all of them. Now, if you know anything about church history and where we are today with all these modern English versions, over a hundred of them popping up, you might think you know where I'm headed with this this morning, thinking, good night. Not another sermon on the preservation of God's Word from Psalm 12. I've heard it scores of times. I've seen the videos. I've got a bookshelf full of books. I know all about the NIV and the ESV and the New King James, etc. If that's what you're thinking at this point, you're both right and wrong. Because though this is a sermon about the preservation of God's Word, this is probably a sermon with a whole different slant on that subject. In other words, this is not just going to be another sermon about how God has preserved His Word for us in the King James and that all the modern versions have been perverted and corrupted. These people have perverted the words of the living God. Instead, the newness of this sermon, if you will, is derived from the newness of a conspiracy theory that actually calls this passage of Scripture into question in a whole new way. Of course, to those who believe in this conspiracy theory, it's not a theory at all, of course. It's fact. In fact, it's the fact is, are you ready for the fact? The fact is, there's an alternate history and parallel realities. Now, if that sounds, if you're thinking to yourself right now, that kind of sounds like science fiction. As you're going to learn, that's exactly what it is. Science fiction. However, as Christians are so feeble-minded today that they'll actually believe almost anything they hear on the internet. Many gullible Christians have fallen for this science fiction, this fable. And in so doing, they're turning away their ears from the truth, being turned unto fables. Turn to 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. And here we're going to read of that very thing. Professing Christians who will not endure sound doctrine but are turned unto fables. And in this case, an old wives' fable, if you will. But notice this truth here about what we can expect if we're, in fact, living in the perilous last days. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 down through verse 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. 
Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And here's our verse. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. What are professing Christians going to do according to these verses? They're going to turn away their ears from the truth. Jesus told us what what is truth. Jesus told us, thy word is truth. They're going to turn away their ears from the truth and they're going to be turned unto fables. In this case, outlandish science fiction. And that, not only with the warning of fables here, but also with the warning about science falsely so-called in 1 Timothy 6.20. If there is anything that shouldn't ensnare ensnare a Christian, it should be science fiction. And yet here's the thing, many are ensnared by this today. In fact, believe it or not, but they're now saying that our King James Bible that we hold in our hands is in error. It's not the preserved Word of God, not anymore anyway. In fact, it's been changed, and this recently, right in front of our eyes, and we didn't even see it happen. So with that in mind, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever heard of the Mandela Effect? Anybody ever heard of the Mandela Effect? If you'll go home today, and you'll get online, and you'll search out the Mandela Effect, you will be amazed at what you find amazed. In fact, here's the first thing that you'll find if you Google search Mandela Effect. This is from BuzzFeed Geeky. By the way, BuzzFeed is just as reprobate and satanic as anything out there. I'll just go ahead and throw that. I'm not endorsing BuzzFeed. This is the first thing that will come up. BuzzFeed Geeky. It says, did you know that there's a term for when you're totally positive something happened even though it didn't? Yeah, it means you're wrong. That's what it used to mean, right? I mean, when you're positive that something happened, but it didn't really happen, that term that you're looking for there, wrong. (laughs) It means you're wrong. That's what it means. However, you see, that doesn't work today. Since we've been taught that we can't judge anybody else's heart or motive or even their own reality. I mean, there's one reality for you and another reality for me and... And since men are lovers of their own selves. In fact, look back there at chapter 3, 2 Timothy 3. Look at verse 1 and verse 2. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. What's the number one proof of peril? For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Like we heard preached one time, lovers of their own selfies. (laughs) Lovers of their own selves. Want an example? The example is you're positive that something happened, even though it didn't happen, but instead of just chalking it up to your own ignorance, to your own being wrong, you come up with a special term, a theory that signifies an alternate history and parallel realities. That is, if you're positive that something happened, even though it didn't, that must mean there's a conspiracy going on where they're trying to dupe you, where they're trying to deceive you. There's a glitch in the matrix, as these people like to say. I was talking to Terry about this the other night, and he said it sounds just like a guy who used to work for it. One day they pulled up to somebody's house there to install some flooring, and the guy who worked for Terry there, he said, we've put flooring in this house before. We've worked here before. And Terry said, no, we've never worked in this house before. And the guy was like, oh, no, yes, we have. I know for a fact we have. And Terry was like, no, we've not. (laughs) And the guy was like, I'll prove it to you. When we go in, the bedroom will be over on the right. I'll take you right to that bedroom right where it's at. And so they go walking in the house, and he's leading Terry over to the right of the house, and he takes him to the right, and guess what's there? A garage. (laughs) But do you know what the guy said? They've turned the bedroom into a garage. (laughs) To which Terry could only respond, you're an idiot. Amen. Well, here's the thing. In the end, that's really all you can conclude when you're dealing with these idiots and their alternative history and their parallel realities. You just have to end up saying, you're an idiot. I mean, as the Bible would put it, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. It's just, you see, the Internet has now given a voice to every idiot. 
Amen. By the way, let me let me say this for the record this morning. The internet is the devil. Amen. The internet is the devil. In fact, it's more of the devil than even television is. Amen. Say, how do you figure? Well, for one, it's more deceptive. In fact, you know that the people on TV are lying to you. You know they're programming you. They told you that from the very beginning. But now on the internet, you never know who's lying to you. And you never know who's telling the truth. In other words, the internet is more subtle than the TV. And who in the Bible was more subtle? That would be the devil. So I say the internet is is the devil. You say, yeah, but you've got the internet. Yeah, it's trapped me in its web just like it's trapped just about everybody else. But I'll never change my mind. The internet's still the devil. And it would be best, hear me, it would be best for anybody who's not yet been ensnared by the devil on the internet to never get entangled therein. There's nothing on there worth looking at, including my preaching. You want to hear it? Just come here. That's it. Amen. But now back to this Mandela effect. Do you know how this Mandela effect happened? I mean, how, how are they doing these things? Well, according to the theory, at least the, the Christian theory, the main Christian theory that I've, that I've seen, in Switzerland, at that Hadron Collider known as CERN, at CERN they figured out how to go back in time, and so now they're going back in time at CERN and they're changing things. And I'm going to give you some of the proofs, some of the secular proofs, in just a minute, that to them prove the Mandela effect. But now the main reason I'm covering this this morning, though, is not because it's just growing greatly in popularity today, and it is, you're going to hear about it, but mainly because they're now saying that these people at CERN, they're actually going back and they're changing the Bible. So again, they're denying what Psalm 12, 6, and 7 have promised us about God preserving His pure words forever. Of course, they've got a clever way around that, too. They've always got a clever... The devil always gives you a clever way around things. You ever notice that? And yet it doesn't change what God said. Now, here's the thing. There are bunches and bunches of professing Christians, bunches, now convinced that the Bible, expressly the King James Bible, is not the same as it once was. How they remember it to be. It's been changed by CERN from what it once was. That's their position. And let me say this, whoever this is from CERN that's going back and making these changes, both secular and spiritual, that guy's a buffoon. I mean, he's a real idiot. You would think that if you were going to go to all this trouble to go back in time, and I'm assuming it's probably, it takes a little bit to do that. If you're going to go to all this trouble to go back in time to change the Bible, you'd think you'd want to make some real changes, right? But oh no, I mean, they're... They're too slick for that, Mark. Too, top of that, they're just testing the waters right now. They're not going to make those big changes until later. They're going to make these little ones and see if anybody notices. Then once we accept those little ones, then they're really going to... You're not going to believe some of these changes that these people think have been made to the Bible. You're just not going to believe it. Now here's what I want to get into. Where are these Christians, professing Christians, getting this from? Coming back to this BuzzFeed geeky article... In response to the question, did you know there's a term for when you're totally positive something happened even though it didn't? It says it's called the Mandela Effect, and a lot of people think it's proof of an alternate universe. So where does this theory come from? Where are these Bible-believing Christians getting this? It says the Mandela Effect is a theory put forth by writer and paranormal consultant Fiona Broom that shared false memories are in fact glimpses into parallel worlds with different timelines. So, here are these Christians, and listen to me, the majority of them are King James only. Meaning that most of what I've seen about this, these people on there, they're saying that the King James is the only true Bible, and so the King James is the only thing they've messed with thus far. So what I'm saying with that is, this is affecting a bunch of our own crazies. These are some of our own nuts and weirdos that this is affecting. CERN, listen, CERN has gone back in time and they've changed our King James Bible. That's what they're saying. Which is a denial of what Psalm 12, 6, and 7 has promised us. On top of that, what did Jesus say about His words? 
He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, my words shall not pass away. So plainly, God has promised that He, God, would preserve His words. And again, there is nothing that any man can do to stop that. But now again, where are they getting this from? They're getting it from a woman named Fiona Broom. Now, if that's not enough to throw up some red flags that she's a she and the she's are not supposed to be teaching. This woman, it said, is also a paranormal consultant. Meaning, she's a witch. What do they call janitors today? Industrial what? Thank you. Well, you see, she's not a witch. She's a paranormal consultant. Like the witch at Endor. She was a paranormal consultant. So where did this old wives fable originate? Get this, from a witch with the name Broom. Like I always say, you just can't make this stuff up. You do know what witches ride, right? It's a witch named Broom. <laughs> but now, why the name Mandela effect? That's what Terry asked me. Does this have anything to do with Nelson Mandela? Oddly enough, it does. It says, Broom says that the origin of her theory came out of a discussion about whether or not Nelson Mandela died in prison. Naturally, this happened backstage at Dragon Con. Now, don't you like how things are shaping up so far here? The theory began with a woman. Not just any woman, though. A paranormal consultant. A witch. On top of that, her name's Broom. It's, it's witch named Broom. Top of that, this theory was hatched at something called Dragon Con. And it involves Nelson Mandela. So, I mean, what could possibly go wrong with this? <laughs> Turn to Revelation 12. Revelation chapter number 12. Let let me ask you this. How slick is the devil? I mean, how slick is the devil? The devil is so slick that for some Christians, he doesn't even have to change the Bible. You hear me? All he has to do is give some witch a theory and then that, that people have actually changed the Bible when they've not. And now these same people who are so worried about their Bible being changed, they're now changing the Bible themselves. Because it doesn't say what they think it should say. That's slick. I mean, they'll talk about Revelation 21, 18, and 19 and that curse on those who change God's Word, and yet they themselves are the ones now who are guilty of doing it. Thinking that somebody else already did. That's pretty slick. And believe it or not, that's what's going on. So, what about this witch and her sorcery? I believe you'll find that in the book of Revelation and her sorcery that came from Dragon Con. Well, who's the dragon and what does the dragon do? Chapter 12, verse 9. And the great de- dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Who's the dragon? It's the devil. What does the dragon do? He deceives the whole world. He's a con. In fact, using the sorcery of a witch to convince King James Bible believers that the King James Bible that they hold in their hands is now no longer the preserved Word of God. So now those people are changing God's Word, the thing they were so torp about to begin with. All right, so what is dragon con? Well, beyond the dragon part, which is the devil, and beyond the con part, which is deceit, which we have both right there in the verse, (laughs) the dragon that deceiveth the whole world, dragon con. Hello. Dragon con is a North America multi-genre convention founded in 1987 that takes place once a year in Atlanta, Georgia. Dragon Con was launched as a project of a local science fiction and gaming group, the Dragon Alliance of Gamers and Role Players. Speaking of which, if you'll go home today and Google Dragon Con and just look at their, their front page of their website, I think you'll quickly discern that this is not where Christians ought to be getting their doctrine. Yeah. It's pretty evident if, if, you've not, if, your, if your conscience has not been seared just yet. Now this is taken from this witch's website. This is MandelaEffect.com. It says, Many years ago, I was one of the two people who coined the phrase Mandela Effect 
during a conversation in Dragon Con's green room. The other person was called Shadow. Broom and Shadow. Then a Dragon Con security manager. I have no idea which of us started using the phrase first. It started when Shadow mentioned that, like me, other people remember Nelson Mandela's tragic death in a South African prison. Apparently, others in the green room shared that memory. So, I researched the concept and, with my pub, uh, publisher's support, started this website for additional research. I thought it was an interesting fringe topic and potential book topic for my spare time. It's turned into something much bigger. So these witches and these warlocks thought that Nelson Mandela died in prison, but they were wrong. And so what did they do? They didn't chalk it up to their own ignorance. There must be something else going on here. I know what it is. It's an alternate history in parallel realities. Just stop taking a nip at that bottle. Stop, stop putting that in your mouth. <laughs> you come back to reality for just a little bit. Get sobered up here. All right, are you ready for some of the secular proofs of the Mandela effect? The number one proof all over the internet. Are you ready? The spelling of the Berenstain Bears. No, that's number one everywhere. The BuzzFeed article says many people who believe in the theory insist that the popular children's book series, The Berenstain Bears, was once known as the Berenstain Bears. Now listen, I kid you not, that is the number one thing to they, that they point to as proof of this Mandela effect. The fact that people can't spell Berenstain. They think it's an E where there's actually an A. That's it! Some of you are freaked out right now, though, I can tell. But was it not? <laughs> Do you see why I'm covering it? All right, think about this. What are these CERN goons doing that is so sinister? Let's go back in time, fellas, and change a vowel in the title of a children's book. <laughs> you want to talk about sinister, man? <laughs> All right, so are you ready for proof number two from the Mandela Effect? Number two, the belief that there are either 51 or 52 states in the United States, not 50. It says most of the people who believe this happen to be from other countries around the world. I mean, you can see that plainly proves an alternate history and parallel realities. The fact that there are people in other countries who think that we have more than 50 states. I mean, they're off by like one or two. Proof. How about this proof? Proof number three for the Mandela effect. Scotland and Wales were once much, much smaller than they are today. How would, how would they go back in time and make, that, make them bigger? <laughs> what, I, and that Wales bordered Scotland on the east. Here's another, number four. Others insist that they have memories of New Zealand, Australia, Sri Lanka, Honduras, and other places being at different places on the globe. So it's not just that they stink at geography. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is what's going on today. No, there has to be an alternate history and parallel realities. What else could it be? I mean, how could we not know where Sri Lanka is at on a globe? Number five. Some say they remember Hurricane Katrina hitting in April rather than August. Number six, some recall that the Columbine massacre happened in 1996, not 1999. Number seven, proof of the Mandela effect. Are you ready for this one? This is, Pam's going to like this one. The fact that some people can't spell dilemma, definitely, and Parmesan. <laughs> they swear up and down. That ain't how it used to be spelled. So Terry's spelling problems, Leslie... They're not really spelling problems at all. It's an alternate history with parallel realities. It's the Mandela effect causing everybody to mess up on their spelling words. Anything except the fact that we're just wrong. Just stupid. But now, again, here's where the real problem comes in. 
Bible-believing Christians have now found that CERN has not only gone back in time and done things so sinister as changing an E to an A in a children's book series, but now they've changed our King James Bible. I'll show you the proof. Turn to Matthew 7. And this is probably the biggest one online. That's the proof of the Mandela effect changing our King James Bibles. For example, I saw one guy's YouTube video on this. And he said at the beginning of it that he had a lot of his subscribers writing to him, wanting him to cover this Mandela effect. But that he'd been hesitant to do so, basically because he wanted to wait until he could really nail that thing down. That this was really going on. And do you know what convinced him that the Mandela effect is real and that, and that CERN has actually changed our King James Bible? Matthew 7, verse number 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. So this is the proof to this guy that he and, and many others feel is just indisputable proof that CERN has gone back in time and changed the, the, the text of the King James Bible. The fact that Matthew 7, 1 doesn't say, Judge not lest ye be judged. Now, how long have I mocked people? And I said mocked for a reason. It's because I mocked people like Elijah did in the Old Testament. How long have I mocked people who think that the Bible says, Judge not, lest ye be judged. I got saved almost 20 years ago. And some of the first lessons that God ever taught me were the things that people think that are in the Bible that are not really in the Bible. See, I did probably what most people do right after they get saved. I wanted to read my New Testament. I wanted to find out about my Savior. And so guess what happened? It wasn't long before I came to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And do you know what I learned among many other things? I learned that Jesus didn't really say what Metallica said He said. Amen. Back in 1991, Metallica released an album, and on it it had a song called Holier Than Thou. That's a direct quote from Isaiah 65, verse 5. In that song, they also say, You lie so much you believe yourself. Judge not, lest ye be judged yourself. Notice how I could just quote that. From 91. (laughs) You know what I thought after hearing that? I thought that came from the Bible. In fact, I guess I've heard people say that all my life. And so I thought that exact expression was in the Bible. I quickly learned soon after getting saved, that's not what it says. And so for almost 20 years now, almost 20 years I have openly mocked people who think that the Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged. I've said it over and over in sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon. In fact, many of you folks know, you've heard me say it time and time again, how that it's the devil who teaches lost people that that's in the Bible. Well, you see, now I know more of the reason why that the devil teaches lost people that that's in the Bible. It's not just so that people can condemn others for quote-unquote judging them. Judge not lest you be judged. (laughs) But now we we learn it's also a setup for what's going on in the world around us today. Deception. Such deception that King James Bible believers are now saying their King James Bible is in error. In fact, the boys at CERN, they've gone back in time and they've changed judge not lest ye be judged to judge not that ye be not judged. And like I said to that guy and many and many like him, that is indisputable proof of the Mandela effect. All right, so... How can we disprove this to any reasonable born-again Christian? Well, you could go through back through almost 20 years of my mockery, 14 of which we have on recording. We got 14 years of me making fun of this. So if you wanted to, you could go back and listen to me making fun of it 14 years ago. Or you could go back to all the old Bible commentaries commenting on the King James Bible, which I did, just to prove the point. And do you know what they all comment on? They all make comment on the words, Judge not that ye be not judged. 
None of them may comment on judge not lest you be judged because they knew back then that that's not in the Bible. So either these guys online with their discernment ministries and notice how CERN is in that discern. <laughs> either they've just been mistaken all their life about what was really in the Bible or these CERN guys really went back in time and they changed every Bible and every Bible commentary commenting on the King James text of Matthew 7. 1. They were really busy. Of course, I mean, when you go back in time, I guess you got all the time in the world. That and they also went back in and changed all the audio versions of the King James. They changed Scorby, they changed uh, James Earl Jones, they, they changed the dramatized Bible, etc. They just went, they changed it all. I wonder how they got their voice to sound like Scorby. <laughs> or better than that, James Earl Jones. <laughs> Who's doing <laughs> Judge not that. It's like, man, that didn't sound right. What is it? It's because it's some white dude from CERN. <laughs> But now why did, why did they do this? Why are they going through all this trouble? Because they basically wanted this truth rewarded just a little bit. I mean, when you really get down to it, it means basically the same thing. It's just it's so sinister, though. I know that's what I'd do if I could go back in time. Don't you just sit around and think about, man, if I could go back in time, what would I, what would I change? I think I'd change... Judge not that you, that you be not judged. I mean, I judge not lest you be judged to whatever, you know. That's what I would do. No, I think I'd change something other than that. I think I could find something better than that to change. You know, I, I would never change God's Word. Never. Of course, that, guy, that guy's YouTube video where this is indisputable proof of the Mandela effect, he's one of the ones that warns of that curse in Revelations chapter 21. I guess CERN went back in and took that S off of that book title too then. You just, you just can't make this stuff up. But you see, this guy couldn't possibly, be, couldn't possibly be wrong about what Matthew 7, 1 said, even though he thinks the book of Revelation is the book of Revelations. But he couldn't be wrong, you see. Not him. But just to give you an idea, this guy's video on Matthew 7, 1, it has over 8,000 views. You know how many views mine will get? Let me just say, not 8,000. And his is one of the smaller ones. There, there are some on there with, I mean, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of views where the people are buying into this. Meaning this is really a thing, believe it or not, and you need to be equipped in this day, day and age in which you live because the, the NIV, ESV, New King James stuff about the preservation, we got that, but man, they're taking it to a different level. Let me give you another one though. Turn to Matthew 9 here. Because on another video, a guy, who, who he, he begins by saying, now, if there's one thing I know, I know Scripture. And he looks like it. This is one of the ones that he really keyed in on here. In fact, to prove his point on this one, he showed the verse in the King James. And by the way, it's all King James, by the way. Get that. It's all King James. Then he opened up one of those like Walmart kind of books, you know, where to find it in the Bible or something like that. And he was like, see there? That's what it used to say right here in this Walmart book because they've not changed the books. They've just changed the Bible, the King James. Well, if they've not changed the books, they've only changed the King James Bible, then they didn't change all the commentaries that all say what the different thing than what you're saying. They didn't change all the sermons and sermon books. They didn't change all the audio Bibles either then. So, I mean, what? Again, these people are just nuts. And yet they're nutty King James Bible believers. And so I don't want any of us nuts to be infected by this nuttiness because we're nutty enough the way we are. I don't need somebody calling me on the phone tomorrow. Man, you talked to you about something. You heard about this Mandela effect? Gosh. Can you give me a second? Now what was it, brother? We're nutty enough the way we are without this nuttiness. But because we're nutty, we can go this direction. Yeah. Now back to that Walmart, where to find the Bible, that different wording that he had there. That book obviously wasn't based on the King James. Yeah. Because there are other versions 
who have the word that he's saying that the word used to be. And so it's referencing, oh my gosh, what, 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 what do you do? What do you do? You just can't, you just can't fix it, man. So here's the uh, sinister change wrought by the goons at CERN. You ready? Matthew 9, 17. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Do you see the word bottles there? Originally in the King James they say, the way they knew it, it said wineskins. You see... Those goons at CERN, they've gone back in time. And you know what they've done? They've changed their Bible. What did they do? What did they change? They changed wineskins to bottles. We're all going to hell now. Sinister. They're just messing with us, Mark. Just messing with us. But now, do you know how sinister these people really are? How slick they really are? How many of you have a Schofield Bible? If you do look there in your Schofield Bible, notice that there's an N next to the word bottles. Now look for that N in the margin and tell me what it says. That's right, it says wineskins. Man, those guys at CERN are slick, ain't they? Not only did they go into the King James Bible and change it from wineskins to bottles, they even put a footnote in the Schofield to cover their tracks. Man, that's slick. But I figured them out. I'm on to them. And brethren, there are whole pages online dedicated to the Mandela effect. There's one that's listing all these, these running changes that people are finding in their King James Bible from what it once was to what they are now. The awesome thing about that page is there's, there's a comments section underneath. So let me give you part of what one person wrote there and then the response from the crazy people. In light of all this insanity that they're putting out, the Bible has changed from this to this, which is some stuff you just would have to see to believe. This guy writes, nothing has changed. Do you people even read the KJV? It has always used the word bottles. The word wineskin didn't even exist until the early 1800s. In the KJV 1611 marginal notes, the translators indicated bottles, alternate meanings to be skins and bags. But they simply chose to trans, uh, translate the Greek word askos as bottles. Furthermore, the Isaiah passage has always had the wolf dwelling with the lamb. Don't you people read your Bibles? That's one of the other things. The lamb shall lie down with the lion and... No, it's the, it's, it's, it's the wolf and the lamb. Now, the lion's in the verse too, but he's doing something else. But you see, preachers have got up and preached that stuff in pulpits for so long that the people, without a Bible in front of them and without checking it, they've heard it and heard it and heard it. And now when they read what it says, conspiracy, they've changed my Bible. No, you just had a sorry pastor. And you're just crazy. In fact, you can go online. David Reagan, he's been dead for over 10 years now. Somebody wrote him online and asked him about, where, where in the Bible does the lion lie down with the lamb? And, you know, over 10 years, 10 years ago, whatever now, he's, it's still on there. You can still read it where he's like, well, you know, people have just kind of combined these into one, but that's not actually what the Bible says. The Bible actually says that's not going to work with these people. Then, then this guy says the word stuff, because they got a real problem with the word stuff, because... The King James wouldn't say stuff. The word stuff has always been in the KJV. In fact, it's used many times. And as I stated above, the KJV was completed in 1611. But the etymology of the word stuff dates back to the 1400s. For me, the most memorable account which uses that word is when Saul tries to hide uh, from being king. And the Lord says, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. That verse has always stuck out with me. The fact that you people and others overlooked it and the other words which you're referencing means nothing. The words of the Lord are pure words. The silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Psalm 12, verse 6. So here's this guy. Fact, 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 fact. How do the loonies respond to facts? Kevin, I don't know who you are. You may be a paid troll to come on here and cause confusion. But you cannot convince me and other saints who have had these scriptures written on our hearts, who have studied and heard entire messages based on them, that what is now appearing in our physical KJV Bibles was always there. It was not. 
The Bible says in Mark, Luke, and Matthew, Take heed lest no man deceive you. Three mentions. Thank you, but explain the change to helpmate from the original helpmeet in Genesis. We can turn back there and it's not going to say helpmate. It's not going to say help meet either. It's a help meet. It's describing the, the good night, man. Explain the presence of corn from the former wheat. Adam referred to in the plural before Eve is on the scene. All of this is laying the foundation for the new world order religion. They're putting a foundation for transgenderism. Is him right there in that last example. Let those with eyes to see. Haven't you noticed it's only the KJB that is being attacked? Ever thought why that might be? So you see, these are King James Bible believers we're dealing with here. Sort of. Sort of King James Bible believers. They were. Because they now believe that their King James Bible has been corrupted. And so now the Bible believers are changing the text of the Bible that they believe was changed. What's their proof? It's because God has written Scripture on their hearts and it doesn't match what's in front of them. Turn to Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28. And I mean, again, I don't know how else to respond ultimately than just like Terry respond to that guy. You're an idiot. Uh, what else do you say? Proverbs 28. I'm in the wrong place? No, I'm not. Verse 26. Proverbs 28, verse 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. You thought the idiot thing was rough, right? He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. In fact, the Mandela effect, apparently it only works on the feeble-minded. It only affects the feeble-minded. And so, I'm trying to comfort the feeble-minded this morning. I hope you let me do that for a second. But now, on, on how that God has written Scripture in these people's hearts, and so now they know that the Bible's been changed because of what's written in their hearts, I would simply say to them, don't just quote what you believe Matthew 7, 1 is. Quote me the whole chapter. I mean, you've, if God wrote, wrote that Scripture in your heart, surely He didn't just write one verse, did He? So quote me the whole chapter. Or I'll, I'll cut them a break. Just quote me that paragraph in Matthew 7. Just give me the first five verses. That shouldn't be hard since God has written the Scripture on your heart. Of course, us, you know, us real Bible believers, we just got to kind of be like, David, thy word have I hid in my heart. Yeah. I mean, if it's just automatically written in your heart, what's David doing hiding it in his heart? Yeah. Anyway. Well, all I can say is God didn't write, Judge not lest ye be judged on your heart. The devil did. Amen. Let that sink in. The devil wrote that false scripture on people's hearts. And now these people are giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, actively now trying to convince others that there is no preserved written word of God left in the world. They have whole videos on the Bible is not the word of God. Who has videos out like that? Who's putting this out all over the World Wide Web? People who were King James Bible believers. It's unbelievable. And so while I would hope that none of us would be deceived by this kind of ignorance, this foolishness, this should at least prove to you that the devil is very deceptive. He's a dragon con. Moreover, many King James Bible believers given to our flights of conspiracy fancy, conspiracy lunacy, and I believe in some of that stuff, don't get me wrong, but we're given to that stuff. And being given to that stuff, we tend to believe everything that sounds like it's something like this. And then we're drawn away by this deception. So brethren, like, like we often point out here, except you stick to what this book says literally stick to what this book says you can be led away with any number of fables no matter how insane they are in reality so I'll say it again you've got the right book if you've got a King James Bible you've got the right book it's still the right book 
And there is nothing that any mortal man can do to stop God from preserving His pure words. All of them. It's like Luther said, That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. No thanks to those earthly powers. God's word abideth. In fact, it liveth and abideth forever. God will forever preserve His pure words.